This is The Enragé, a show where we take a deeper dive into written works published at the Center for a Stateless Society. Join us as we give voice to the ideas challenging the vain phantoms that haunt our social reality and stand in the way of total liberation. For more information, visit c4ss.org. And to support this show or any of the other projects happening at the center, please visit patreon.com slash c4ss.org. Thank you for listening. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to a very special 22nd installment of The Enragé. This is your host, Eric Fleischman. Today we'll be joined by former Enragé host, Joel Williamson, to discuss his article, Constructing an Unfixed Freedom, originally published at Mutualism Co-op and now available at Center for a Stateless Society. Joel Williamson is an individualist and mutualist anarchist from Texas, who has participated in a variety of activist projects over the years. His passion for a freer world has been expressed through a range of anarchist organizations, including Non-Servium Media, Center for a Stateless Society, and Mutualism Co-op, to name a few. Joel, thank you for coming on the RLJ. Hey, Eric. Thanks for having me. How are you? How are you this holiday season? I'm doing well so far. I got to I gotta say that I think you're a lot better at at, at pronouncing on Roger than I have ever been, ever. <laughs> uh, so it's it, it's it's good to hear that that C4SS now has a host of this podcast who can actually pronounce it. But <laughs> I'll be honest, it's it's because my boyfriend speaks French, and whenever I try to record this, and I go on Roger, like no, <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah, I'm damned to like to just never get the pronunciation correct. So it's it's good that so the, the host of the show can actually do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I I've, I've just been busy with with work and with activist stuff among other things. But I'm excited to be here today, and um, I think you've been doing a tremendous job hosting the On Roger, and uh, it's a pleasure to be on the other side of this podcast for once. Yeah, it's kind of crazy because I'm actually not only am I interviewing you, the former host, but I'm actually recording in the same space that I recorded my first episode of the Enrage. So it's all all coming together. Nice. Mm. And before we talk about your article, I want to talk about the Enrage and Mutualism Co-op a little bit. Sure, sure. So after hosting a podcast at Non-Servium, the Enrage was part of your early involvement with C4SS, with you as host and James Tuttle and myself as producers. Um, I'm curious, what was it that prompted you to get involved with Center for Stateless Society in this capacity, and how was your experience? Yeah, so I got involved with C4SS when I was still hosting the Non-Servium podcast. That show is fortunately still going strong with their new host, Lucy Steigerwald, who is also doing a fabulous job as my replacement. But I think it was Zachary Woodman who first approached me about potentially hosting my own new show at the center. And I was delighted at the idea because I've always been a huge fan of C4SS and was excited to start contributing to an organization that is been so fundamental in helping me shape my ideas over the years but if i'm not mistaken i think it was i think you said that it was it was your idea to recruit me right uh i was one of a group to uh who who came to the conclusion um just as you as were a fan of center for sale society center for sale society has been a fan of non-servium and your work for quite some time so it was a committee that conspired to do this it was it was a committee, that's, which is very very socialist of us. <laughs> that's beyond flattering, I gotta say. Yeah, um, and while you continue to stay involved with T4SS, your latest article that we're going to talk about today was actually originally published at a site called Mutualism Co-op. This is a fairly new website, but has already attracted a lot of really interesting market anarchists, left libertarians, mutualists. Can you give us some background on what Mutualism Co-op is and what sort of the goals of this new website are? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and just as a side note, I wish I could be more involved with C4SS. It's just that 
things seem to never slow down, you know, like I'm just so busy right now with everything with between work and everything. For sure. But, um, well, the door is always open. Don't no, well, I appreciate no question that. about that. Thank you. Well, uh, but yeah, um, mutualism co-op developed out of the necessity in our minds anyways, for an explicitly mutualist presence on the internet. So there are, long held and widely known institutions for communist anarchism like libcom.org or say post left anarchy like little black cart but there really hasn't been any long standing well known organizations that are understood as an explicitly or maybe exclusively mutualist centered project obviously we do have places such as Sean Wilbur's libertarian labyrinth that does excellent translations of classical mutualist texts as well as hosts some of Sean's original writings. But we wanted to make our project something that anyone can contribute to as far as as far as writing goes. So mm. we're definitely more like C4SS in that way. But what separates us from the center is that our ideological focus is more narrow, perhaps, and more explicitly fo focused on mutualist anarchism. But yeah, a couple of years ago, a few of us decided to to, to start meeting regularly until this thing launched and we've been we've been happy with the direction of the project to this point but we also want people to know that we we do plan to extend our efforts beyond organizing a mutualist library and blog spot so we're interested in branching out towards various media projects maybe a podcast or possibly eventually incorporating an online store or something like that but that's awesome yeah that's awesome yeah that's it's very interesting to see something like you're saying like a very strictly mutualist because center for stateless society and non-servium and other of these organizations in that sphere tend to be more widespread anywhere from marxists who are in favor of a market system to all the way to like your classic left libertarian with sort of mutualism as a backdrop. But it's, I'm glad that there's now a website that's specifically about mutualism and the very rich tradition that comes with it. Sure. Thanks. Me too. I mean, honestly, I, I, I was hoping that someone would do this. If I, if I wasn't involved, I was hoping that someone would just start this, you know, just do it. But mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, C4SS and non servio media has to exist also. Like the, the big tent thing in my opinion, is necessary and needs to happen. But, um, you know, everything, it must belong somewhere. And, well, Mutualism Co-op is kind of focusing on its on its own thing. And I just, I, I'll, I'll add to what I was saying earlier and, and, and finish with, uh, if anyone has an opinion about creative ways or new ways to help grow awareness of mutualism, feel free to reach out because we're always interested and open to creative ideas that help us expand the scope of what we do as an organization. Awesome. Awesome. Well, moving on now to your article, Constructing an Unfixed Freedom, which was originally published at Mutualism Co-op. Can you give our audience a brief summary um, of the piece and why you chose to write it? Absolutely. So I wrote Constructing an Unfixed Freedom because I felt it was necessary to reframe and reiterate our understanding of the anarchist project as something larger than the goal of statelessness or any other particular manifestation of unfreedom for that matter. But I argue that if we're interested in engaging with anarchism as a sustainable and realistic project, then it's necessary to view our politics as one centered around a gradual and experimental expansion of freedom in every known and unknown aspect of life. So I start the article out by acknowledging the foundational feature uh, or a foundational feature of the human experience, which is individual self-interest. I argue that our self-interest is often directly tied to our desire to self-direct and that the assertion of this self-direction is our will to freedom. I then explain how the ideal expression of that freedom is found in a state that I call ethical mutualism, which is largely absent from the social status quo. And after that, I express how ethical mutualism is best realized through the only political philosophy that values freedom higher 
than any other philosophy, which is, of course, our beloved anarchism. And finally, I explain how anarchism is best understood as a gradualist arrow, which is something I very likely picked up from Will Gillis. Mm. Um, but it's a gradualist arrow and expressed through a practice that I call tactical particularism, which leads us to a holistic and practical emancipation. So uh, lots of words there, but that's my attempt at a summary. Yeah, well, let's, let's jump into that. You first talk about self-interest. You say, quote, that in every interaction and through every social structure, humans exercise an unavoidable psychological instinct known as self-interest. But you don't restrict this to this sort of atomistic, destructive self-interest, and you instead identify it as primarily a desire to self-direct and is best understood and actualized through the many spheres of social interaction we encounter throughout our lives. Interlocking webs of relationships, formal and otherwise, mold the content of our self-interest in a way that reveals the importance of reciprocal freedom. And you call this reciprocal freedom basically ethical mutualism. Can you elaborate on what ethical mutualism is and maybe how it differs from standard ethical egoism and its ideas of self-interest? For sure. So I think ethical mutualism, as I lay it out in the article, is definitely some form of ethical egoism. But I think it's sort of a, I think it's also sort of a combination of that and psychological egoism. So it's not only that we should pursue our self-interest, which is ethical egoism, but it's that we're sort of bound to it, even if we're not aware of its motivational power which is psychological egoism. So I sort of combine those and claim that its practical application is through a behavioral state that I think aligns with core instincts and intuitions already found in the human animal. So, yeah, we are always permitted to promote our interests, but also I argue that the content of our self-interest is bound up in cooperative efforts with others for survival and flourishment. And therefore, sort of implies a type of social reciprocity as opposed to domination and oppression. Mm -hmm. Which is a very different idea of what self-interest is from your standard capitalist, you know, bulldoze everybody in your way sort of logic. Yeah, for sure. Honestly, I, th I think Alex from the center kind of helped me formulate this in my mind to some extent when I interviewed him on the non-Serbian podcast, actually, a couple years ago. But yeah, it's just kind of a side note. Yeah. And you get this terminology, mutualism. You, you borrow the mutualism from Pierre-Joseph Proudhon's mutualism, mm -hmm. although it's, it's a separate thing. It's a, it's a philosophy which you say includes ethical, political, and economic implications that aren't fully explored in the article. I'm curious, um, how are ethical and political mutualism, particularly that of Proudhon, related? Sure. So many people rightly see Proudhon as developing an entire philosophy that isn't limited to political economy, although commentators seem to often emphasize his economics for whatever reason. To be honest, I look to thinkers like Kevin Carson and Sean Wilbur when trying to wrap my head fully around everything that is Proudhon. Um, but as you may have guessed in the bio that you read in my introduction, I sort of gravitate personally towards the individualist emphasis of Benjamin Tucker's circle of mutualist egoists. So for many of the classicals like them, equitable exchange or anti-capitalist markets were an extension of their egoism. So sort of like labor is only free if we're also allowed to own and trade the means of production sort of thing, you know. And actually, Mutualism Co-op the other day republished an article by Emil Armand where he said something along the... We pulled a quote from the article where he said something along, along the lines that his, that his individualism is necessarily anarchist because the state concretizes the best organized form of resistance to individual affirmation hmm. or something like that. And if you're familiar at all with mutualism, you'll be familiar with the extent to which it focuses on how the state 
has played and currently plays a role in creating and maintaining capitalist domination. But anyways, egoism at its best will emphasize what it wants freedom for. And the political economic side of this is an articulation of that, in my opinion. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and then in regards to the ethical part of mutualism, the, the, the sort of Tuckerite interpretation of Proudhon, you point out that as opposed to what a lot of anti-capitalists say about this world being, you know, founded on self-interest, that the world, quote, falls short of the standards in ethical mutualism and that we, quote, live in current conditions that are defined by hierarchical, large concentrations of power, money, and influence. Um, you see this not as a product of ethical mutualism or like a self-interest, but of a crude egoism. And mm -hmm. you describe domination as an exercise in a confused will to freedom. Can you talk about what differentiates this, this standard capitalist understanding of self-interest from a healthy and mutualistic self-interest and will to freedom and why crude egoism is has such a hold on human societies? Yeah, absolutely. So this is this is a good question. And I should probably preface it by saying that I have taken a lot away from Nietzsche's work. And I continue to find profound insights in his writings that have definitely influenced my thinking. But as we all know, he's inspired a vast array of political tendencies and is no stranger to reactionaries also. So if I'm being honest, I did get a, a little bit of satisfaction out of calling out one of their sacred thinkers, um, or at least a, a certain interpretation of that thinker. In your in your differentiation between will to freedom and will to power, right? Defin definitely. From my perspective, Nietzsche's will to power wants freedom for me, but not necessarily for thee, and can be perfectly expressed in the role of a tyrant. I, I see no contradiction there, but... As I say in the article, a freedom that impedes on another is a vain effort towards self-actualization. Because if our desire to self-direct can only truly be realized in an, in an environment where everyone is free to do so, then our personal self-actualization depends on maintaining freedom for all. But this, the question still remains, right, like, what started this off? Like, why did how did we get to the situation? Why did Cain kill his brother? How is it that the social status quo or, you know, our economic and political institutions and interpersonal behaviors, how is it that that has become so intoxicated by hierarchy? And honestly, I think this question might require a longer format than a podcast. But what I'll say is that once domination is pursued, it requires even more domination to maintain. And humans abandon cooperation because of the short-sighted inability to see others as counterparts to their freedom. And it has remained intact for so long through propaganda efforts and learned behaviors that create intergenerational norms that promote sort of insular survival within the course of confines of an unfair game. Hmm. It's interesting. You, I asked you this question, and then I realized as I was saying it, you asked me a very similar question in the first interview you ever had with me on the other end of the Almanche. Oh, really? How institutions come to form. And it reminded me because I was also like, to preface, I um, there's more stuff than we could possibly say about it. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, this is not the concept. But I think it's super interesting. And I think it's really interesting the way that you – talk about will to power, because in many ways, will to freedom is what I think a lot of left-wing Nietzscheans would say what will to power is when it's when it's productive and good and not corrupted by um, particular human institutions that are, you know, left behind by the ubermensch. Fascinating. Yeah. I, I just think, I think that's interesting. Yeah. But so you talk about how, you know, we're in this present condition of, of, hierarchy and large concentrations of power, money, influence. And you explain that the only real way out of that, you know, to obtain an ethical mutualism as an end goal is something that, quote, elevates freedom as its highest value, which is anarchism. Uh, you particularly point to Emma Goldman's definition of anarchism as, quote, a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation 
economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. There's always been a lot of debate about definitions in anarchism, and I'm curious, is this your preferred way to describe it, or do you have another preferred definition of anarchism? Sure. Well, first of all, I just love Emma Goldman in general. And to be frank, I'm not sure how anyone could write an article without quoting her. <laughs> Uh, I just love her poetry and, and veracity as a thinker and historical figure. But, you know, she's another classical who surprises you with her embrace of egoism, mm -hmm. even though she was definitely inclined towards communism, obviously. But her definition of anarchism is very satisfactory for me for many reasons. It's not the only definition that I'd use and... I'm not certain it's the absolute best I've ever heard either. It just seemed to sort of fit the spirit of what I wanted to convey in my article. So you're right. She said, anarchism is the social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. And first of all, she rightly frames anarchism as aiming towards something. It's not just a target, but the trajectory that she chooses to emphasize. It seems fitting then to imagine this trajectory as an arrow, as she goes on to explain how it is aimed towards emancipation. So the emancipation she speaks of is vast, one that relates not only to the economic and political, but also to the spiritual. And finally, I think the emancipation she speaks of is obviously not limited to emancipating the single unique but rather every single one of the uniques, <laughs> the, the entirety of humanity. So how could you not love a definition like that? Yeah, and you touch upon something that I feel like comes up a lot when people talk about individualist anarchism, which is this, they're saying, oh, you're an individual, so you only care about yourself. But it's, it's, this, it's this universal individualism, the kind of thing that Goldman, Tucker, Dyer, Lum, Voltaire Declare focus on, which is like, it's not just about one individual being free, it's about all individuals being free, all individuals being able to have the opportunity to cooperate and self-actualize themselves. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And you talk about the an arrow, you know, pointing us towards this angle. You talked about present conditions, you talked about the ethical mutualist end goal, you talked about the ideology that will lead not lead us because it's anarchism. It doesn't lead anything. <laughs> but you talk about the strategy that is integral to the success of anarchism and sort of the end goal of ethical mutualism as Proudhon's progress by approximations, where, quote, more and more freedom would be won through gradual pragmatic steps towards liberation. For you, what does this look like in practice? What are some projects being undertaken right now that you feel are taking those gradual pragmatic steps in an anarchist way towards an ethical mutualist end? One that should probably always be emphasized in every theoretical conversation we're having, because ultimately it's about what we're doing in the here and now, right? It's not just like kind of what we're speculating about or how to frame what we're doing, but it's about real world relationships that we're developing and um, the actions we take to pursue emancipation that we want. But, uh, you know, at risk of, of totally... I don't know, uh, discrediting myself. I mean, I personally think that the egalitarian end of crypto holds promise. 
and that those engaged in expanding, say, like commons or public goods using blockchain technology, I think that stuff is fascinating. I'll be frank. I I am, am basically ignorant when it comes to like the back end of that technology. That 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 stuff is magic to me, essentially. But it's just so cool that people are engaged in that, and I see a lot of a lot of interesting, promising things coming from it. But I guess beyond that, I think building up and expanding upon and replicating in different ways the ideas of self-defense or organizations that are interested in cultivating that, such as the John Brown Gun Club. I think that's a step towards towards realizing what cooperative defense could look like without the without the state. I mean, as an individualist and mutualist, I'm I'm not necessarily opposed or afraid of contracts. I mean, even under current conditions. So I'd like to see vulnerable communities lean into arrangements with these groups similar to these for self-defense rather than the police. So doing this would demonstrate, obviously, a promising alternative to the problem of policing. I guess also, I don't think the cooperative movement is going anywhere, so I'd like to see that continue to grow and become more prevalent. I think that firing your boss is always a good idea if you can hack it, and so, so, so yeah, the, I mean, the cooperative movement I've always been kind of interested in also, but I don't think that you could answer this question without highlighting what Kevin Carson and a lot of other people have focused on, which is do-it-yourself technology. Like projects like the Fourth East Vinegar Collective, for instance, like who help expand healthcare outside of the restricted status quo. I think that's just super inspiring and amazing to see that continue to grow. And it's not just medicine. I mean, whether you're making your own utensils at home or your own firearms, anything that helps circumvent centralized efforts to regulate human freedom is, in my opinion, a very good thing. Mm. Yeah. And you point to this gradualism, these kinds of projects, whether it's contractual relationships with which is very, very Samuel Edward Konkin, which I really like, the, the activist defense organizations. You point this gradualism to this gradualism as being fundamentally different than mass revolution, which is sort of the standard orthodox Marxist way of seeing social change. Um, but then you also warn against that gradualism taking on a liberal reformist uh, approach, focusing on entrenching civil liberties through the state. The standard binary that a lot of socialists propose that you get from Rosa Luxemburg is reform or revolution. So what would be your advice on how to avoid these two extremes in practice, move beyond this binary and, and focus on a gradualist approach? For sure, for sure. It's funny that you mentioned Sam Konkin because, I mean, I, I, I would be lying if I said that his, a lot of his thinking hasn't like deeply inspired the way that I approach a lot of these things. So like I came to mutualism through largely through an agorist lens. So mm. like focusing on gradualism or just building institutions outside of sort of prescribed modes for political change has kind of been my focus for a long time now. Thanks to, thanks to his thinking, obviously it goes without saying that the dude was like problematic for different reasons. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, but you know, it, it, it seems like everyone who we've ever taken inspiration from has been problematic in some way. So it's like, you know, that's just, it's just it just is what it is. But whatever, that's a complete tangent and a side note. Um, the alternative to formal revolution or liberal reformism is creative insurrection. It rejects the authoritarianism of armies and the death of our radicalism through assimilation. So... Like, the game of liberal reformism is such that really it can only reproduce itself. It's sort of, it sort of definitionally has no room for the sort of impractical emancipatory promises that we demand or, or emancipatory dreams that we seek. So creative insurrection holds, it holds the spirit of the revolutionary, but moves beyond centralization through tactical particularism. So there's no there's no one size fits all when it comes to the infinite ways in which power dynamics manifest themselves. So we have to stop waiting for the revolution and start building the tools necessary for 
our respective problems, which we immediately face. Similarly, politicians, while not all created equal, can't be trusted, whether in competence or in character, to abolish themselves. Um, and as I say in the article, it's not that we shouldn't celebrate the liberalization of drug policy or the loosening of border restrictions. On the contrary, we should celebrate those things. It's just more that as anarchists, we shouldn't we shouldn't put all of our eggs in that basket, but should instead emphasize the creation of alternative ways of being. Mm -hmm. And this emphasis on alternative ways of being, of creative insurrection, of acting now, creating now, this is in contrast to, again, orthodox, vulgar Marxism, especially because, and this is probably one of the main reasons that I am not a, a proper Marxist, is you see the real ability for individuals to act autonomously under present economic conditions. Um, you call it anarchy in action, hyper-individualized solutions that no party or blueprint could solve. Um, in the face of like, you know, large scale projects, how can we work to emphasize this methodology in contrast to, or in addition to larger struggles among networks of people to solve social problems like you used the example like our collapsing healthcare system in the United States. And then are these two approaches interconnected, mass struggle and hyper-individualized anarchy in action? I think that's possible. I mean, the advantage of tactical particularism is that it acknowledges our capacity to act in ways that are most relevant to our particular problems. So healthcare affects us all. Having a single healthcare system is a stupid and bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're doomed to suffer if we continue to imagine that either bureaucrats or CEOs have the ability to navigate monopoly systems in a way that serve everyone's needs, right? I mean, it's just, if we take a step back, is it not wildly preposterous uh, and, and, and sadly dangerous that such a system is allowed to continue, you know? I mean, and then also, like, how long have those who have been working within the rules and confines of the system, especially in America... How long have these well-intentioned individuals who have been trying to chip away at solving the healthcare crisis in this country, like how, how far have they gotten to fix it, right? I mean, it just reiterates the problem of monopoly and the utter inability of liberal reformists to imagine a world beyond, you know, half-baked European dreams, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I think we can do better. And it's past time that we start to imagine creative ways to free ourselves whether that means working individually or collectively in larger networked systems. So I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm curious, collectively working as networks outside of this sort of standard struggle for, say, universal health care, what about approaches like syndicalism or communalism, libertarian municipalism, these sort of more not so focused on individual but on cooperative effort, but also outside of the state. Do you see these as efforts that mutualists and individualist anarchists and market anarchists should get involved with or ally with? Possibly. I mean, I kind of like syndicalist tactics more than I like syndicalism, you know? <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? Like it's uh, all these things are, in my opinion, a, a part of a larger ecology of ways to free ourselves. Um, I think it's important to not get stuck in sort of a limited ideological framing of what it is that we're after. So, you know, the, the one of the problems with syndicalism or democratic confederalism or anything like this, they're, they're both beautiful in their own ways, but they kind of have like a very fixed notion of, of means and ends. And while I, I suppose that serves some sort of function in potentially helping expand anarchy, I think it, maybe we should be weary of sort of um, bike shedism and closed systems that move us from here to there, if that makes sense. For sure. For sure. And I think the reason I ask so many questions about Marx, about syndicalism, these sort of questions, is because you warn against an unnuanced left unity, especially with tankies who are likely to repeat history and betray anarchists, betray bottom-up movements in the name of party or progress. And I totally agree with you. But at the same time, speaking for my own, my own, and I, I put a lot of work into pushing for left unity, especially with non-authoritarian Marxists. 
So I'm curious in a totally non-confrontational way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you, would you advocate for allying with with non-anarchist socialists and communists to achieve common goals? Like, or is it like you're warning against fascists, which is better to avoid altogether? Sure. Well, I mean, it's. I think it's interesting that some people, some people frame tankies as like existing outside of the left, right? They're like, well, these people, you know, these these are just red fascists. So it's like. You know, a true left unity can only be had with people who are like, you know, inclined towards anti-authoritarianism, which is an interesting response. But I think that like, you know, maybe perhaps, uh, I don't know, uh, elevates leftism to like a degree, you know, it's trying to like purify leftism into being like this, this sort of like big tent thing that could, could actually function, which maybe it can, but you know, whatever, that's kind of a side note also, um, to answer your question, I think it's hard to yeah I I, uh, I think it's hard to imagine a situation where we could work together with fascists towards any goal that doesn't lead to brute hardship. So short of working with you know short of working hand in hand with Nazis, there are many problems we face to, today that don't require any particular political identity in order to accomplish certain tasks. So for instance, like in the case of an environmental emergency, for example, where we're doing mutual aid out of necessity, for example, like, do you think it matters whether or not we all have the same politics, you know, like in, an, in a moment of disaster, of distress, of chaos, what matters most is that we help a fellow human, not whether or not those helping are perfect anarchists, right? I mean, I, I, I say this because while I do warn against an ungodly anarchist tankly alliance, uh, it doesn't mean that we can't necessarily be productive with, say, non-authoritarian Marxists, depending on the situation. I mean, there's no ideological Turing test with tactical particularism. The point, kind of the point that I was trying to make more is to not get pulled down by the current of populist alliance, right? And to instead identify and overcome unfreedoms in all of their complex forms. And the conclusion of your piece is talks a little bit about that, and you label it practical emancipation. What is practical emancipation to you? That's right. The last little section of my article is titled Practical Emancipation. We started off with self-interest, moved on to the will to freedom, to ethical mutualism, to anarchy as an arrow, to tactical particularism, and finally practical emancipation. Uh, practical emancipation means constantly discovering new freedoms that are waiting to be realized. It means aiming at something as grand as ending the state or as quiet as perhaps exiting a toxic relationship. As Emma Goldman said in her quick definition of anarchism, practical emancipation is what we aim for. It's our world to come, but it's also our inspiration for freedom now. Awesome. Awesome. Is there is there anything we haven't talked about in this interview you want to chat about, whether about your article or anything else? I can't think of anything off my head. Um, I appreciate you asking that, though. I just want to say I hope that you continue to do uh, – I hope that this podcast continues to happen. I think that, again, you're doing a great job, and I'm just looking forward to – more episodes that you're producing and that the center is doing because it is, um, it is doing, it's just, it's just great content. So, so keep at it. And, and you're a very talented and smart person, Eric, Thank and you. we're all better off having you contribute your ideas and your efforts to, uh, to emancipation. I, the feeling is mutual. The feeling. Thank is you. Mutual. It's kind. And for those who also feel that way, What's about you? What's the best way for listeners to follow you and your work if they found this interview compelling? Sure. So my Twitter is at Nalevo A3 if you want to follow me there. I'm more than happy to um, to engage with you there. Mutualism Co-op's Twitter is at Mutualism Co-op. Our website is MutualismCoop.com. I'm trying to find our Mastodon. Although I guess I shouldn't call it Mastodon. I think people are calling it the Fediverse and I keep failing that shibboleth and people are recognizing me as like the spiritual boomer that I am. Uh, our, our handle for Mutualism Co-op is at Mutualism Co-op 
at collectiva.social. And my personal handle on the Fediverse is at Nalevo at collectiva.social also. So, yeah. Fantastic. Well, Joel, thank you so much for coming to join us on the Orange. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Eric. And I hope you have a good rest of your day. You as well. All right. Bye.